Okay, so let me explain why I'm doing this. I'm doing a spoiler review for a movie that came out six years ago. But I didn't really talk about spoilers in my Shin Gojira review that I put up the other day. Because I'm going to assume that some people who are subscribed to me have not seen Shin Gojira. Even though it's an older movie. I have more to say. I went back and I watched the film a second time. So let me just get this out of the way. If you have not seen Shin Gojira... I'm telling you right now, this is my absolute favorite. Shin Godzilla is my favorite disaster movie of all time. It might be my favorite. I think it is the best disaster movie of all time. Now, the original Godzilla from the 50s, that one, I don't know if I would call it a disaster film, but that one's right up there with this one. But that one obviously would probably edge this one out only because it was the first one. But when it comes to what this movie did to add new things to the story... Uh, and aspects, I think this one, um, I, I enjoyed this one a little bit more. Now, with that being said, I'm going to go into spoiler territory because, like I said, I've seen this movie now three times. I've, I, I, I've never, not never, but I've rarely seen a movie and then gone back and watched it two more times. But I was mesmerized by this movie, so we're going to go ahead and talk about spoilers because I have a lot to say. Okay, so the fact that Hideaki Anno who wrote the script and also co-directed the movie with Shinji Higuchi, who's really known more as a special effects guy. You know, this movie, dude, when I saw it the second time, it made more sense. Like, it, I didn't pick up on this the first time. I stayed away from reviews, didn't really focus too much on that. But Hideaki Anno, like, there's a lot of talking in this film, and I think people who were expecting, like, monster versus monster kaiju battles like the other Godzilla films or even the legendary pictures ones might be bored by that but that's not how you view this movie you have to view this movie like the original Godzilla from 1954 or you have to view this movie as a disaster film or as a what if and I think that the big what if is what if Godzilla were real and I don't think any Godzilla film whether it be from Legendary or from Toho, has ever truly captured what would happen if Godzilla were real. This is the closest they've come. The original Godzilla is up there, but I think this is the closest they've come because the Godzilla franchise went from being this very serious first film to then kind of becoming everything from a a kid's story with some of the middle movies, and then we have kaiju battles, and they became this big spectacle. You know, and it got more and more spectacular when you get to the Hensei, Heisei era and the Millennium era. My favorite is the Heisei era. I love those films. They have the perfect mix of, like, cheesy special effects and good ones, and Zilla looked great. And then in Mille- the Millennium era has some great entries in it, like the Tokyo SOS one and Final Wars, and they're just over-the-top insanity. This movie, though, Shin Godzilla, Shin Gojira, this film is the scariest and most horrific Godzilla movie to ever come out. The movie is creepy and weird. It won Best Picture of the Japanese Academy Awards and Best Director, and there's a reason why. So, with all the stuff about the talking, the talking is supposed to be an allegory. It's an allegory or a, a, some have called it political satire for how the Japanese do things. And it's very accurate. Before the Japanese make a decision on something, you know, even if it's a giant lizard attacking their town, they have to go to a committee, to a meeting, go to a different room. Everyone has to say their, their, their words. It's all about democracy and how democracy is you know, not just one mind. It's not a dictatorship. It's multiple minds giving their suggestions. The problem is that Japan's very slow with this, and this mirrors, and I read about this after I saw the film, and it makes more sense, this is supposed to mirror the Fukushima nuclear meltdown and the 2011 earthquake and tsunami. Now, I was not in Japan when this happened, obviously, but I remember hearing about it, but I didn't really pay much attention. There were scenes in this movie that were meant to mirror that. Godzilla himself is an allegory for Japan's failure to act on what happened and as the movie progresses you see Godzilla transforming and he's almost like he's creepy he's very horrific and very creepy how he goes he he ends up on land then he mutates again transforms and goes on his hind legs 
They have a chance to kill him, but because one person was crossing the street or two people, they didn't do it. They could have taken him out then, and they did. Now, we find out later on in the movie that, well, they may not have taken him out at all because as the film progresses, you find out that Godzilla is not a traditional... His origin story is different. In this version of the story, and if you're watching this, you've already seen the movie, but just to give you a fresher upper... In this version of the story, Godzilla was originally like a uh, an ancient sea creature, but not like a lizard, just like these microorganisms. And they, they started feasting at some point on nuclear waste that was dropped in the ocean, in the Pacific, after World War II. And as time went by, these organisms kind of clustered together and began to evolve because they mutated thanks to the nuclear... Um, the nuclear uh, waste, the toxic waste. And it's one of those things where all of that sort of, all of that is kind of how Godzilla is able to evolve. It's an ever-evolving creature. And I don't have the art of Godzilla, the art of Shin Gojira, but in that book it talks about how had the story continued, Godzilla would have had four more forms, including his last form, which would have made him evolve into a literal god, a singularity. And that's that's crazy. But he was evolving at a very fast pace, so Japan hit him with everything. And it didn't do anything. All it did was piss him off. Which is really the focus of the middle of the movie. The halfway point, about an hour and ten minutes or so, is that absolutely horrifying scene. And I've seen a lot of Godzilla films. I've seen a lot of disaster films. I've watched them all. Everything from Independence Day to 2012 and all that stuff. And a lot of them are trash. Not Independence Day has got charm to it, but a lot of these movies are garbage. This movie, Shin Gojira, is the best, absolute best disaster film I've ever seen. Because the scene in the movie... When he gets blasted on his back by those bombs and then he unleashes the atomic breath, this version of it is one of the most horrifying scenes. Like in other movies, I'll sit there and I'll be cheering like, yeah, I fucked shit up. You know, I'm into the movie as more of like an action story. But the way that Hideaki Anno shot this, the way the special effects team put it together, the way the sound works and the music that played has this real depressing, melancholy tone to it where it feels like the world's coming to an end. Then he does this long shot, like this this sort of like um, wide shot of, of Tokyo, and it's up in flames. And it literally looks like Armageddon. It looks like the end of the world. It's like a post-apocalyptic. Like that imagery, to me, is just as horrifying, if not more, than the 1954 Godzilla. And the sad part is that Godzilla is not really a villain. He's evolving. He gets attacked first, technically. He doesn't know what he's doing, except that he learns how to defend himself, which is why he's able to shoot the, the back photons and eventually fire photons from his tail and evolve. And so they're not dealing with a traditional Godzilla where you can drop a bomb on him or send a, a mech after him. This is They don't do that. In other Godzilla movies, they send other monsters after him or they devise some kind of new weapon. Here, they literally use the science mind of Japan to figure out that they can freeze him because of his blood. They coagulate his blood. And they have to be very creative in how they do this. So they turn the Japanese trains into bombs and they use American drones and they have this whole plot at the end. So the ingenuity of Japan. While while Hideaki Ono simultaneously lambasts Japanese politics, he also puts over Japanese ingenuity and scientist uh, scientific minds. And that's beautiful. Like I realized how good this movie is after seeing it for a second and third time. I didn't it almost went over my head as to all the things that were going on. I, I don't know why, but it is a movie that the more you go back to it, the more you pick up. Like for example, the prime minister character He's not a bad guy. None of the people in this movie are bad people. They're trying to do what's best for the Japanese people and for their own reputation as well. But it gets to a point where your own reputation has to take a backseat because people are dying because of this giant creature. You got to figure out what you're going to do. And it also shines a light on how Japan is very submissive to the United States. Since World War II, Japan's been very submissive. And the Japanese people, like, because I understand Japanese culture, because I've been to Japan, I have Japanese friends, I've done my homework, I look at this movie different than other people do. 
Because I understand, even though I've never experienced it, I was not there for the atomic bomb of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and I was not there for any of the tsunami and earthquakes, but I understand that from their perspective, this movie's even more horrific. People being trapped in their homes, people losing everything. And they show some of that in the film, but they don't overdo it. They show it more from a grander scale than just showing like one or like, you know, a lot of Roland Emmerich disaster films focus on like one family trying to survive. They got to drive across, you know, this part and hide here and do this and that. They all have the same formula here. It's a it's much more of a national and later on international problem. The entire United Nations gets involved in this, which they would in real life if this actually happened. And that's what blew my mind. This is the most realistic Godzilla film ever. If this, they explain his origin well to where it makes sense. I mean, we know that nuclear fission and we know that nuclear, like, power can produce and do things that is dangerous. And the movie really takes an allegorical look at nuclear power. Both its pros and its cons. It's clean energy, but what happens? What happens if an organism can actually look at this? We find out in the movie that Godzilla's flesh can actually evolve itself into other Godzillas. It may be slow, but it's as sure as hell is faster than any other predator. And I like how and I'm talking about this movie again, bro, because there's a lot I missed in the first review. So I like how um they like there's the lead a scene, right? I'm gonna get which is total Evangelion, where they find this piece of fleshy skin with a bunch of eyeballs popping out of it. There's already another Godzilla being formed from the skin already. And so what I was trying to say with that is, you know, it's not in the movie, but because it was they say it was too horrific, but there's enough horrific imagery. Like Godzilla bleeds in this movie a lot. A couple times in the film he straight up bleeds. And the fact that his lower jaw opens up like a snake to fire the most effective atomic blast in any Godzilla film is crazy. Because in most of these movies, like when I watch Godzilla, like Godzilla versus, versus Mecha Godzilla or any of these films, I cheer on Godzilla. He's the good guy. He's protector of the earth. Not here. He's just a creature. I'm not booing him. I don't, I don't want Godzilla to die, but he almost has to die for us to live. And the ending of the movie is very creepy, very creepy. So they show Godzilla's tail, and I had to watch it a couple times, and he's got these bizarre humanoid creatures leaving his tail. Like, they're literally trying to escape his tail. So it's like Godzilla's dropping off parts of his body, evolving. Now, everyone and their mother has their theory about what's going on here. I think, I think, there's a couple things going on here. Surface level, Godzilla's tail evolves differently. We see the tail open up. It's a split second when they mention the scientist who was doing the research, Gorimaki. And there's a theory that he injected his own human cells into the organism so that eventually Godzilla would be able to create these humanoid zombies, basically zombies, right? And we see it. But here's where things get creepy. If you really pay attention... There's a wide shot of Godzilla frozen in the middle of Tokyo, right? And it's the part at the end of the movie with Rando Yaguchi having the conversation. Um, and, he, you know, you see Godzilla in the background, right? But you see his tail has not changed. But then they cut to Godzilla and his tail changed. Now, I thought that originally what that meant was that Godzilla was literally in the process of evolving as he was frozen. And then those creatures coming out of him were frozen. But the fact that he actually froze and his tail did not have those creatures emerging from it. But yet, oh, it's so creepy. But yet in the next scene, we see them there. That means that even though Godzilla has been frozen, those creatures are still coming out. That means that his tail, a part of his tail may not have been fully frozen. That means that he may have evolved to the point where his tail, because there's a lot of theories about his tail becoming its own head and its own Godzilla. But what's happening here is sort of like that, where even though he was frozen, it seems like we're all screwed. It's a very depressing ending, because even though the world is happy that Godzilla was finally frozen and that there's peace again, 
Maybe not. Because I saw that ending as kind of a cliffhanger. And they don't have to make a second movie. They don't have to. In fact, I kind of hope they don't, to be honest. But the idea there is that even though they beat Godzilla, the fact that those creatures appeared on his tail after he was already frozen means there was a time skip. Which tells me that if they were to do a continuation of the story, those creatures would eventually, maybe slowly, thaw out, drop out of Godzilla's body, and then either become human-sized zombies. Because they were still pretty big, though. Maybe they're giant zombies. Or eventually evolve into more Godzillas. In other words, we're screwed. I mean, the human race is done. Because they kept talking about how the U.S. could drop a nuke on Godzilla. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, that would kill him, but... (laughs) <laughs> he's made of nuclear power, so that might actually, he might get more powerful from it. They could write something like that and it would make sense. So it's almost like the the end of the human race has happened because of our own misuse of nuclear power. That's the way I interpreted that. And also, another thing I think Hideaki Anno was going for, because this is totally how he does things, is I think could be wrong, but I think that the idea of humanoid creatures coming out of Godzilla's tail, I think is supposed to be a message that even though Godzilla may have seemed like the apex predator of the earth, the real apex predator of the earth is humanity. Human beings control this planet. We have technology, we've developed weapons that the animal kingdom can't fight against. Sharks, alligators, lions or even lizards, cannot beat our ingenuity and our technology. They can't. They can't. No animal can survive human technology. So human beings are the apex predators. And I think that he was saying that. Like, So Godzilla figured out that the best way to beat humans is to become one himself by creating his offspring. It's just very creepy, bro. Like, I'm scratching myself right now. Like that that ending freaked me out. And I didn't talk about it in the other review because I wanted to make it, you know, I wanted to make it a uh, non-spoiler. But here I can gush about it. What a great fucking movie, bro. The scene in the middle of the film and the ending sequence are incredible. And I don't find it boring. I, I actually thought the political talk was good satire. It doesn't last the whole movie. It's just the first act. Later on, it becomes a thing about, okay, well, we got to figure out how to beat it. And I know some people have said that that third act is boring, but I didn't. I thought, I thought it was interesting. Even watching it over again, I learned new things. So this is a great movie, dude. Like, I don't know. I, I do miss... Like Godzilla fighting other monsters. Luckily, the legendary movies are still doing that. But this Shin Gojira movie, bro, I don't know. I, I, it's a great fucking movie, bro. It's my favorite. I think it's the best disaster movie of all time. I really think so. I'm being serious. I can't think of one that I like this much. It actually outdid Independence Day, which is not a great movie, but also one that people really, really covet. I, I, I mean, I like Indep- I love Independence Day, but that's because it's wacky. It's not that serious. It's it's more fun. Whereas this is just horrifying. It's a horrifying, horrifying film. 